Hey, good evenings, good evenings, good evenings, Cape Flat Stories. Hope it goes good with you. Um, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Uncle Stan Show. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about um, South African police services, budget cuts, civil unrest, corruption, and attacks on police stations. And also there's something that I want to talk about is the re-enlistment program um, or initiative that I don't know why it is not being used, why it's not being, um, you know, um, promoted in, in Parliament. Um, it's something that I believe that can help our people. It's something that I believe that can, you know, change the way um, SEPs are currently operating. And with me in the studio, I have two gentlemen. They will introduce themselves now. Um, some of the two, they used to work for SEPs and, and they will give more information or more introductory to themselves. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome to Cape Flat Stories. Hi. Evening, Sam. How are you doing? I'm good in yourself. I can't complain, man. Uh, just, just give your your, your your name and your surname and also, you know, um, your career in SEPs, just to give people a background on, on, on what it is that you were doing in um, SEPs. Okay, my name is Robert Baker. Um, I was in you know, I was in SEPs for about eight, nine years. Um, through my career in SEPs, I worked in most spheres of policing at the station level um, from Vispol. I went over eventually to detectives and I ended my career working at court as a liaison officer. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. And on my left and right hand side, I've got a young man that I know for very long. His <laughs> name is Theo Brown. Theo, just, just give us more um, of a um, you know background on yourself as well. Okay. Good evening, uh, Stan. Um, I was in SAPS um, for over 20 years. I started in 1998. Um, most of uh, my career... Within SEPs, I did um, crime prevention, worked at Claremont Police Station, worked at units, and then um, I eventually finished up at the RRPU uh, retreat, which um, is the railway environment. Awesome. Um, Robert, I just want to come back to you on, I know you guys are representing another group of men. Um, there's more of you out, out there, there's a lot yeah. more than you, um, of you out there. The reenlistment program um, started, you said, in 2012, right? Approximately 2012, yeah. 2012. It, it may have gone back further than that, mm-hmm. but the, the earliest that I could find reenlistments being opened was 2012. 2012. And to date, um, how many people were recruited um, that did you know of that but that was taken back into, I mean, you know, SAPS? Um, look, around the country, um, I don't know. It's mm. um, only someone that works in HR will be able to tell you that. Mm. I do know from statements that um, Colonel Andre Trout, who is uh, the provincial spokesperson for SAPS, made in the article in the report that since 2015 to date, they have recruited uh, 192 ex-members back into SAPS. Mm-hmm. It equates to roughly about 32 a year, which is nothing compared to what it, what they could be getting back. This year they are considering now 37 applicants in the Western Cape. Mm. And if you take the shortages in the Western Cape into account, I mean, what is 37 members going to do? Yeah, yeah. And and just to come back, um, you know, Cape Town is one of the most dangerous cities, in, not in South Africa, but in the world. And for that reason, we need the resources on the ground. You know for a fact, and I know for a fact, that SEPS is currently understaffed. Um, we need and no intervention immediately, but also on the other hand, SEPS is cutting budgets. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure, you know, how this reenlistment program will actually, uh, you know, come into play. Because if there's no money, then you you can't hire stuff. But just on a more more on a more positive note, how would this benefit SEPS? If if I take let's let's say I take tomorrow a thousand um, you know officer um, ex officers and I bring them back into the system. How would this be beneficial to Cape Town and to the rest of South Africa if this program should then pilot here and, and move out? Look, what it does, um, if you look at the guys, and it's from the guys that I know from the last two or three years tr- um, applying for reenlistment, the you're looking at about five, six hundred years worth of experience that SAPS is desperately in need of. The guys that are in SAPS at the moment that um, have got the experience and have been there and can mentor the new guys coming in, Mm -hmm. they are basically just succumbing to the status quo. They just don't care. Mm -hmm. 
the guys that need the mentoring, the guys coming from college, they're not getting it mentoring, and it's it's it puts the the the, the public perception of SAPs. It makes it very negative that the police are poorly trained. It's not that the police are poorly trained; they just they're not getting the level of training that they should. At college, they get your training level at college is it's good. Yeah. You you get the training you need, but that's theoretical. Your training really starts once you start your field training phase and you're at the station, you're on the road. Then you start learning, really learning. And there isn't people there that have got the experience that can give that experience over to the younger generation coming in. And it's something that SAPS needs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at these guys that have got um, experience in all spheres of policing, from Vispol at the station level, um, driving the vans, working in the CSC, in detectives. You've got guys that have gone up into some specialized units mm -hmm. and guys have gone into some highly specialized units mm -hmm. and it's experience that SAPS needs. That's right. And I can't understand why the process is dragged out. They take so few members back. Mm -hmm. A year you're losing maybe 2,000 members, but you're taking back 200 members yeah. besides the guys going to college who's going to be there to mentor those guys when they get to the station mm. so i mean you know it's yeah i don't know it's it just it doesn't make sense and that is the problem is when those guys come from from training they're still fresh yeah and yeah. now you have somebody that has been there maybe for a year that that may maybe have a little bit of experience and that one year now needs to teach the new uh, you know, individuals coming in about what's currently happening. And, and I think along the way, we're losing a lot of information, a lot of data from the old guys, because it's things that you're only going to learn on the street. It's only things that you're going to learn from experience. Um, I just mm -hmm. want to come back to the question, Theo. I know you, you've, you've also been on a railway uh, um, environment. Well. Yeah. I want to know from you. I mean, we have a big problem. Our railway is, is this messed up. And, and, and we need people to be the, what do you think? Should they also maybe take on guys and, 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 and um, from, from the lean enlistment people? Because that means that they, they won't need training. They can just get on the train and do their, their job because, uh, you know, people are being robbed, people are being killed on, on the train, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly, Stan. Um, at the moment, like rail, the railway environment, they very understaff. I mean, if you look at the number of trains that's running, mm -hmm. you can't be everywhere at the same at the same time. Um, you need to be on the trains. You need to be on the platforms. You need to uh, to patrols. So um, yeah, uh, ex members coming in will most definitely make a, a big difference yeah. where crime is concerned in the railway environment. Mm -hmm. And um, just to come back, also, I mean, we also have law enforcement. We have metro police. Um, is this also an area where the guys would also be interested in? Because I know for a fact um, that I know the city takes on a lot of leap offices um, and they go for, for like training. In this case also, I, I, I believe anybody with experience, uh, you know, instilling it in somebody else saves the company a lot of time and, mm -hmm. and like money. Is this something that, that the guys would be interested in maybe getting into law enforcement metropolis? Most definitely, most definitely. And with some of the people that I've spoken to, um, it's not just guys in the Western Cape, it's guys from all around the country. Mm -hmm. And they are willing to relocate to the Western Cape to yeah. give their services to the city of the Western Cape. So it is definitely something that the guys are interested in, yeah. yes. I have quite a few friends working in the, law in, um, in the police environment in SEPS. And... I don't always want to bring color into thing, in, things. We don't want to do that, you know. But I think we also need to be very honest. And, and for that, you know, s sometimes we need to say things that, that might upset people. Um, I think also a, a, a lot of cops actually message me earlier on. And, and I can't mention their names, obviously, for, for yeah. certain reasons. Um, what will happen is a person will come in with five years' experience and the colored person needs to train them or the white person needs to train them. I don't want to bring color into this, but I have to say this. And that person that's training them will train them maybe have 15 years of experience. After this, that person trained the person of five years. Automatically, the person of five years, you know, give orders to that person of 
15 years. And I think that's why a lot of cops are also leaving is because it's unfair. The, the SAPS has become an unfair play, workplace where people are not being really looked after. And I feel that is where we also need to maybe look at. I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I think it's, it's, it's a matter that also why people are leaving. Most definitely. Um, BEE in its and affirmative action for one, it's it's killing SAPS. Mm. It is it's it's killing SAPS because SAPS is losing a lot of a lot of uh, uh, um, hardworking, dedicated, honest cops mm. due to affirmative action. Because I mean, you've dedicated your life to 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 to, to fighting crime in this country. You've dedicated your life to this country. Mm. You've been willing to to pay the ultimate sacrifice yeah. to give your life for this country, and now you've got. Junior members that oh we don't go into that area it's too dangerous. Mm. Since when? Mm. The blue line doesn't stop because an area becomes dangerous. Yeah. That blue line covers everybody. Yeah. And if you're not willing to make that sacrifice, then you're in the wrong place. Honestly, you, then you should rather seek life elsewhere. But that is that is the problem, Rob. In a lot of government jobs, people do it for a salary. Exactly. You've mentioned to me early on, you guys. Uh, you've been born to do this. Yeah. This is what you. Th th this is your passion. Many years ago, you know, growing up, not everybody could join law enforcement or um, or, or, or SAPS. They did a, a check on you. If your yeah. father was a gangster, or if there was somebody in your family that was close to you that was a gangster, you wouldn't have been easily been let into SAPS. No. Um, I mean, our task force was one of the best task force. If yeah. if you think about it, we had that intelligence, yeah. but that intelligence is no more there. No. And for that reason, we need to be honest about what's currently happening. We are allowing people into SAPs that is not supposed to be there. It's a passion. You know, Stan, um, sometime last year, I actually came across a post on Facebook. Um, it was a woman that she was celebrating, her, I think it was her 28th birthday, and um, that she'd been in SAPs for six years, and she was a brigadier for six years. Mm. Which means she walked into SAPS at the age of 22 and walked in as a brigadier. What experience do you have at 22 yeah. to, to even justify that? What could you have ever done in your life at 22 mm -mm. to say, yeah, I'm, I can be a brigadier. I can lead people. Mm. And then she, she actually got upset when people didn't take her seriously in her job. Mm. And I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't. You half my age, you don't have any experience, but you want to tell me what I must do. Yeah. I mean, we. Yes. And 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 also, um, I think that these youngsters or these people, when they come into SEPs, they easily get promoted. I think that's the thing that, that we have a problem with. It's easily being promoted. We, like I said earlier, and the uncle or the guy that has been working there for 20, 15 years is still in the same position. Yeah. But because of affirmative action, He's been now been 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 labeled. Uh, you know, don't allow him to grow. I think one of the biggest problem is is management in SAPS. That that is our biggest problem. Yeah, look, you know, it, it happens. Um, you've got a current a colored guy been there thirty years. He's a warrant officer. You've got a a young constable that's just come out of college. Hell of a chip on his shoulder because my dad is a colonel. Now he does what he wants to do. He gets picked up. He gets disciplined for that. The next morning, you get a phone call from the from the provincial office or from national office. Stop your racist ideas. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with race. I think this is the biggest problem. There is no there's no discipline because the, the young guys have got no discipline. They've got no self discipline, mm. and you can't instill the discipline in them because then you're racist. Yeah, and that is and that is the problem. We have young people, and, and there's nothing wrong. We were also young at one stage, but we didn't have the knowledge that we have now. We had yeah. to grow into this knowledge, to, into this experience. Any job you need to grow into. I want to just ask you guys, um, you know, people that you've been dealing with um, in your group. You know, I'm, there's a lot of you guys. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you, you need to still survive. You still need to make money. You still need to put food on the table. What is many of these guys do, doing now? Because I just want to give people an idea. We have, we have people that have skills that are ready to be the uh, redeployed or, or, or take back into SAPS. What are these guys doing now? You know, most of the guys um, are actually not employed. Okay. 
a lot of it um, you find the, the the member that's wait, waiting to go back is not employed, but the spouse may have, may be working. Mm-hmm. So they've got that covered. But especially um, like I can understand it f- uh, from a man's side. Um, I'm the man of the house, but I'm not bringing an income in. But my wife is bringing an income. You know, you don't you don't feel like a man. Yeah, it it it, it hits your pride. Yeah, and it is difficult. And the guys are struggling. We've got one member that um, she actually um, she lost her house because she wasn't working, yeah. and she was staying with um, another friend of hers, and their house burned down the other night, and then she came out. And two colleagues or two two members of SAPs and one was a, a, a colleague that she'd worked with was standing making a video laughing about this that this person's house is burning down. I mean yeah. we we have ever I mean oh yeah. the 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 um, human side they've got no empathy. Yeah. yeah. And, and and as a police officer you need to have empathy. Mm-hmm. It's not just a case of whatever scene we go to, um somebody's gonna be arrested or we come in there to shoot you or anything like that. You need to have empathy. You need to be able to see what has happened from the victim side. You need to see from the person that is suffered that loss or has had it happen. You need to see it from their side as well. Yeah. You can't go there and make fun of a person. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like they're carrying on about gender-based violence. Granted, we know um, that most of the stories that you see in the paper about gender-based violence, it's against women and children. What about gender-based violence against men? Men mm. are victims of gender-based violence. Mm. Most men won't report it because they get made fun of in the police station yeah. when they want to lay a case. So, I mean, yes, granted, there should be no gender-based violence, but it goes both ways. Yeah. Touching on gender-based violence, you know, I have a lot of friends of mine that are into the gender-based violence um, activism. And there's the one thing that, that that they actually speak about is a lot of, you know, when when these victims go to the station, a lot of these cops working there or, or people on duty um, don't know how to talk to them, don't know how to relate to them. It's when they come there, like you, you mentioned now, if, if a man comes there and he tells the officer, my wife, um, it, my man, my friend, my husband, and and then they would laugh at him, mm. and I think that is the type of 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 things that is actually also chasing people. And there's not there is a lot of good cops still out there, but we also need to look at the professionalism of the current cops that we have, and yeah. and that is what what we're struggling with. Uh, no, um, I agree with you hundred um, percent. There is there is a lot of members in SAP still that are trying to make a difference. There are those that are there, they're hardworking, they're dedicated, they're honest cops. There are some of the new guys that have come in. You can see the guy's got the potential. He can be so much more. But he's not utilizing that potential because he's not being shown how to utilize that potential. Mm-hmm. And it's a, that seems to be the status quo. It seems to be the way things are done now. Yeah. yeah. And to see what is happening to, to, to SAPS, I mean, they're losing how many members? Mm-hmm. Basically on a daily basis. Yeah. Members resigning, members retiring, members dying, members mm. being arrested. Mm. When last did anybody have anything positive to say about SAPS? That's right. In the media, when last mm. did what's a positive report about SAPS? Yeah, yeah. Not mm. in ages. Yeah. And and that brings me to the mental health of our SAPS. You know, I know when you guys started, you guys started way back, right? And you had to go through a certain... Um, you know, uh, test to see if you guys can can handle the pressure. I mean, you have people in SAPs that, like I said earlier, they don't belong there. Yeah. Um, like I said, they do it for a salary, and also it's affirmative action. And for that reason, our justice system is struggling because now you have people that is not supposed to be there. They can't mentally, they're not mentally strong enough to handle the pressure. I mean, you guys have seen obviously stuff and witness stuff that is not normal. Yeah. And and some people crack under this. So to come back is that I don't see that also anymore. Where our people is uh, those in um, you know they 
They escape weekends or some of them become uh, um, alcoholists. Uh, they drink every night. They smoke drugs every night. You know, just to escape the reality. Yeah, alcoholism is a big thing in SEPs. Mm. A lot of guys that I know in SEPs, even while I was there, I mean, come on duty in the morning and the guy stinks like alcohol. Yeah. And you've got to go work with that guy today and he's not 100% there. They have, look, the police have a program in place that's called the, the Employee Assistance Program, eh? Yeah. Or the Employee Wellness Program. Employee Wellness Program. Uh, mm-hmm. Which, I mean, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's not worth the paper it's written on. Yeah. Because they really not there for you. Mm-mm. They don't. They're supposed to, if you're involved in a, a shooting incident, you're supposed to be debriefed on that. Mm-mm. The guys are just left. Yeah. Now, two, three months down the line, the guy sitting with PTSD, oh, he's weak. So that's the guy's week. He, he's had to deal with something that yeah. no person should have to deal that's with. That's right. And he's got to he's got to process that on his own. Mm. And it's, I mean, when the guy cracks under uh, under the pressure, then uh, uh, he gets get shoved one side. Yeah. Instead of being there to help the guy from the start, they just left. Mm. And that actually brings me to, you know, also. We, you know, you have people in that don't belong in certain communities. The, you know, the, the the makeup of that community is different. Um, you know, you can't go into community if you can't communicate with the people, if you can't understand their language. Correct. And I think that's one of our biggest problems because of affirmative action. We're putting people in positions that can't talk to the local people. Exactly. You know, and I think, the other, I mean, as you can say, when Afrikaans prat, so there's no prat. Yeah. Some of the cops that is currently need alles 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 verstaan. They won't, yeah, alles alles. And 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 now they're actually missing a lot of in information because they can't, uh, you know, they don't know what a person is saying. And at the end of the day, they just tell the person to go back. And and in that, you know, many things are not reported because the person behind the counter don't know how to communicate. Exactly. Yeah, they they talk a lot about representativity. But if you if you look at the, the the makeup of the station, it's not representativity or it's not representative of the community that that station serves. And that is a, it's another area we we saps is failing because it's like like you say the 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 guy behind the counter doesn't speak the same language as you. So either they refuse to open a docket or um, the docket gets open, but it's not even worded correctly the statement because he doesn't understand what you're saying that's right and it's things that can be avoided i mean if you just apply a little bit of common logic you know just switch on your brain matter before you open your mouth Mm -hmm. you can do things properly but the status quo as it stands now we've got people that are making decisions and honestly it's people that shouldn't be in positions that they're in what is the thing that you most that you most miss about the, you know you say it's your passion right and, and 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 you live for this what is the thing that you most miss about your job being in the community on a daily basis it's it's serving a community it's doing what i can to help the next person regardless of race color creed religion whatever the person needs your help and you're there for that person. Yeah. I had a case one day, um, we arrested this woman for possession of drugs. And by the time we got to the station, um, I wasn't feeling comfortable with this whole, this whole thing. So I took her one side and we had a quite a long chat. And instead of opening a docket, I called that trauma counselor and I got her in to speak with the trauma counselor. We booked the drugs in as found um, unattended, found on, along the road, and booked that in. <laughs> and a couple of years later, I was on my way home the one day, and this woman stopped me in the road, and she said to me, I just want to thank you for what you did for me. Mm. And I was completely lost. I didn't know who she was until she explained to me who she was. Mm. And she'd been clean now for a number of years. She'd actually gotten a job. Wow. She'd gotten the kids back. Mm-mm. She looked, you could see she looked better. Mm-mm. And it was something that I had to just say to her, no, you know, it's my job. And I had to leave because it it was something that hit me hard. Yeah, yeah. And that is the kind of stuff that I missed. 
a lot of the guys will think, oh, it's the action, giving the car chase and stuff. That's the, I mean, you miss that. When you see the guys working, uh, your heart yearns to be back there with them. But the main thing that a person misses is you miss that opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. Mm. To take somebody who may have come off the path a bit and just guide them back onto that path and help them in life. But that is what is missing. Aside from being this tough guy, this cop, you know, you also need a bit of human, human is, uh, you know, that human side. Yeah. Because some people, like I mentioned earlier on to you guys, yes, we, we have problems, but that criminal is also a person. Yeah. You know, and some of them are not actually criminals. Just that m moment, yeah. they made the wrong decision to do something that they were not supposed to do. And for that reason, I mean, if I look at how some of the, the now cops handle situations, yeah. it, is actually, it actually takes away the pride, you know, of, of those that actually are real cops because they handle people as if they are animals. Yeah. And that is what I, I, I really despise, you know, the way they speak to people. You know, when, when I grew up, I grew up in Pago, then we moved to um, Krasi Park. So now Krasi Park Police was one of the best police stations. And, and, and I actually heard this many years later, there was at one time where Krasi Park was the number one police station in South Africa. I never knew that. And Somebody can confirm it, but okay, we, we can get into that, um, into that again. But what I saw was that the cops that worked there were guys that actually really cared about the community. It was guys that really wanted to speak to people. They didn't just arrest you. Yeah. There was a relationship between some of that criminals that would, that was released, later would come back just to visit and speak to those uh, cops, you know. And I think that is the type of a relationship. We mustn't have this relationship where people must be afraid of cops, but we must feel safe when, you, when we're around them. Now, you know, if you've, if you've got that humanity, you've got that empathy with people, it's, you also, that way you, you, you can build up a network. People will feed you information later on. In New York, a few years ago, you know, I mean, we all know New York. New York has always been plagued with crime. Mm. And they started what they, they, they refer to as a broken window policy. Mm. Any broken window they saw, they'd go in and investigate that broken window. And then from that, then they uh, it branched out. They stopped concentrating on going after the drug dealer. They went after the drug user. Mm. So you're taking away the, the sales base. You take away the sales base, what are they going to stick around for? They should do the same here, but I've noticed they, they get this tendency, they want to go after the big brain the whole time. Mm -hmm. Take away the smaller guy, and it's going to open up the big guy for you. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of people outside of SEPs would say, get the big guy. Um, but I, did, I, I, I don't think we always have access to the big guy. You, you, you first clean up here with the small guy, yep. and then you work your, your way up. I think a, a lot of time, Rob, we, we, we as citizens, we think we know the law also. Yeah, um, look, you know, I've always said it's easy to sit at home mm -hmm. and want to have your say about everything. You watch the rugby on Saturday, oh, the Springboks could have done this better or that better. You watch a report on the police, oh, they could have done this better or that better. Until you've been in that situation and you've had to deal with that specific situation, mm -hmm. you're actually in no position to comment on that situation. Mm -hmm. And... Unfortunately, we as people, we want to have a say. That's it, that's right. That's it. I just want to read something. Robin Jacobs, um, Gwen, commented something here. Hi, guys. Last night, um, an incident here by us. Um, two old people, they can't really speak English. And there is two African policemen. They couldn't um, understand a thing. because the old lady was explaining Afrikaans. So some other people that don't even know what has happened, um, explain. So... There was an incident, what, what, what's the strike actually say? There was an incident last night We, what we spoke about now, the language barrier. And I think this is something that happens not only once in a month or once in a week. I think it happens daily. Because yeah, the people in SEPs, let's say the, the people in Mutual Spain don't understand Afrikaans. And for that reason, there will be more um, rivalry because now he, the person is telling you he's not guilty. And, and, and the way how he's saying it, and he can prove it, but you as a cop don't understand what he's saying. You think he's now fighting you. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that is something that, it, it sounds petty, but I think it's something big that that can re really, it, it must be sorted out, but it must be sorted out in a way where we need our own people in our own um, areas. We don't need people that, um, not that we don't need, but we need people that understand our people. 
No, definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, take a province like the Western Cape, where you've got such a high um, uh, um, you've got so many coloured people in the Western Cape, and most of the coloured people people speak predominantly Afrikaans, mm. but then they are uh, most of the stations that are, are covering their areas. They've got very few Afrikaans speaking members. So it, it, it causes conflict between the community and, and, and SAPS at the end of the day. Mm. It's going to cause conflict because SAPS isn't understanding what the, uh, what the people are trying to say to them. And then the people are getting upset with SAPS because, oh, you, you guys only do your jobs properly. Mm. You know, um, we need to see it from both sides. Yeah. We really need to see it from both sides. You know, a lot of times I would, I would say SAPS gets a bad rap unnecessarily. Yeah. I'm not saying, um, look, the SAPs I left and the SAPs I joined, it's two totally different organizations. Mm. It is two totally different organizations. And I'm not saying that the, 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 the bad rap that SAPs is getting is undeserved. Mm -mm. But people need to see it from their side as well. Mm. It's you're working with, um, your budget's been cut, but you are still expected to perform at that higher rate, uh, higher level but you're getting less money out for it. Yeah. So uh, uh, um, the people, uh, like uh, the members, your, your increases aren't being passed or you're not getting as high an increase as you should get. Yeah. And you, you basically, you're staying on the bread line. Mm -mm. And that is also another reason why I find the corruption is so high because I'm earning so little, I've got a family to support. Mm -mm. So I've got to supplement my income somehow. That's right. And, they, and they, they, they're switching to crime, mm -mm. which... It's no excuse, really. Yeah. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, I'm sorry, it doesn't justify you committing crime, you stepped outside the line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, being a member of the police, um, you hear they, they refer a lot to the thin blue line. Mm -hmm. Now, when you are in, in SAPS, you're basically straddling that thin blue line. You've got one foot in the grave and one foot in jail. Mm -mm. And that is how you walk through your career. And you've got to find that balance to keep yourself on that line. And I think what, what you mentioned out there, Rob, is that what saps you don't know if you're going to come back home to, 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 tonight, your, your, your job is, also, your life is also in danger. You're living, as you, you, you're living every day as you're living your last day because you might just go out today. I mean, with all these guns out there, with all these gangs out, um, out there, I think it's much more dangerous nowadays for a person to be a, to be a cop because... I've heard of stories where two cops would go into a certain area and just all of a sudden they will be ambushed and guys would start shooting, you know, yeah. and these guys would fear for their life. And some of these guys, like I said, they commit suicide or they turn to alcohol. Um, and, you know, some of them just don't care anymore. There's no more pride. Um, I don't want to do my best anymore because my life is in danger. I think this is all things that is actually becoming too much for individuals. You've mentioned earlier on, Rob, you were a, a detective, right? I've heard recently, and I think I've mentioned to you earlier on, that on average, a detective gets between 250 dockets to 300 dockets on his table. Yeah. Was it like that back then when you were also a cop? Because, yeah. I mean, crime has increased. Crime has, has increases every day it increases. And for that reason, obviously, there will be more dockets, there will be more cases to investigate as well. Yeah, look, it, it, it depends on the, the on the station you work at. Like a station like Mitra's Plain, you obviously, I mean, their case hits two, three, four thousand for the month. Mm. When you get a, a station like Simonstown, if their case hits two hundred for the month, they've had a busy month. Mm. So yeah, it's it, it's been like that for a while. Uh, the detectives, um, I I honestly feel that. For a number of years now, the detectives have been understaffed. Mm -hmm. They haven't had enough members in the de in the detective branches, so you do carry um, you do carry these big uh, big caseloads, and you cannot, in any sense of the word, um, you work maybe eight hours a day. As a detective, you usually work normal office hours. You do your standby, mm -hmm. and then um, that is usually over the weekend. While you are on standby for that week, basically. Um, any crime scenes you need to come out to attend. Now you used to get a standby allowance for that, mm. which they don't get anymore. Mm. The guys that work at um, LCRC as well, the, the forensic guys, they don't get the standby allowance. So if you die on a Friday in the in the road, you're going to lay it till Monday. Mm. 
Because they're not going to come out after hours to yeah. do the scene because they're not getting a standby allowance. Yeah. Listen, it's, and it's not important for them because you know what? It's it's my time and it's my money. Exactly. You know, there's also cops that have two jobs. When they come from home, they go into another job just yeah. to make extra money. Just and for that reason, the one is like I said, the one just becomes a job because we have two jobs. I now need to sell after work. I need to sell clothing uh, because I'm not really making it. And I think that is what is the problem. I mean. Many years ago, when I grew up, being a cop was something that you wanted to become. You wanted to become a cop because our cops back then were they were the best. We had the best Definitely. task force. We had guys. I mean, if if I look at some of the old cases, we could just call the guys and say there was a specific task force. That they would do anything. Nowadays, we we don't have it. Um, some somebody said the other day, it looks like all the intelligence left saps, and that is and that is a worry. Yeah, no, it is. It is. You know? is, um, I really, I don't even think that uh, uh, um, SAPS is, uh, the crime intelligence is, is what it used to be anymore. Mm. I mean, look, uh, those days we had, we had SANAB, the, the old narcotics bureau. Mm. They had the old gang unit, um, the old murder and robbery squad. That was experience. That was specialized units that had built up years of experience. They decided we didn't need it, shut it down. Mm -mm. Guys, they, they shut it down. The guys left left the police. Most of the guys left the country. Then they decided, oh, we actually need those units. Now we want to get it back. But now we haven't got that experience anymore. Because now they want the guys to come back. And the guys, why? Mm -mm. But that, that also brings me to, to you know, you guys put what probably know Peter Bale. He was, he was one of the three best cops in the world. And he was a local cop. He was a cop. He was the cop that solved all the, the, those crimes back in the day. In, oh, um, Pete Bellefeld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they used to call him the 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 bail. That's the type of guy. That, and, and he has passed on. But that was the type of guy that that knowledge he should have actually passed over. There should have been after he retired. There should have been somebody that got all that that knowledge and 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 was trained. You know, and just so many other cops, good cops, actually pass away and they actually you know. That knowledge and that wisdom actually goes with him, yeah. and for that yeah. reason, we have a big problem. We have a big problem um, in the sense of the way forward. If we yeah. don't take the knowledge, the, the guys like yourself now to train these youngsters or the new um, recruits, what is going to happen? Because these new recruits, some of them might just leave after a few years, and then there's new, there will always be new rec recruits um, if we don't bring in experience. You know. Um the guys are at college at the moment. They're going to be in college until December. Mm -mm. December, they're finishing up. December, eh? yeah. yeah. December. There's already guys that are leaving, packing up and leaving. Yeah. So we, they should be having 20,000 new cops coming in. Mm -mm. They don't have that 20,000 cops coming in. How many guys are leaving? Mm. How many guys are even going to complete their basic training program? How many guys are going to finish their, ba their, their field training program? You can't say. What they do these days is you do know, um, they call it a psychometric test. SAPS has got a profile and they look on the psychometric test, do you fit this profile? If you fit that profile, you go to the next step. If you don't fit that profile, they discard your application. Yeah. But they're not actually t uh, uh, checking, uh, are, you, are you mentally fit enough to do the job? Mm. Now you get a guy, uh, I've been in the police two years now, I'm a super cop. I attend my first murder scene and I can't even keep my lunch down mm -hmm. because, I mean, some of the murder scenes that I've been on, uh, to see what one human being can do to another, it's it's actually disgusting. But anyway, mm -hmm. they can't keep the lunch down. Mm -hmm. So how is that guy supposed to function now as a police officer and he's got to deal with that on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. Two years down the line, that was borderline alcoholic or he's, he's drugged to his eyeballs or he just decides one day, okay, well, that's what I see every day, so it's my maker. And he takes out his wife and his kids and himself. Mm -mm. And we have heard a lot of those um, cases, um, suicide cases, where a, a lot of cops actually kill their wives. Um, there's a case happening now in Stramfontein where they want to put the guy to Stramfontein. Um, there's quite a few cops that recently committed suicide. And, for, and, and I think it's for that reason, the stress that actually adds to it. Um, like you've mentioned also, I don't think the guys are also getting the proper uh, No, look, help. you know, the public's perception of a police officer, you are 
you're held in this mold, you are, you're a super cop, you're a super person. Nothing gets to you, you can handle anything. And there's nobody in SAPs, in senior positions, that are actually trained to look out for what are the warning signs. Mm -mm. Because as a cop, I'm not going to come to uh, my station commander or go to my, my shift commander and I've got a problem, I need help. Mm -mm. Because then I'm going to be looked at like I'm weak. So I keep it to myself and I deal with it on my own. Mm -mm. And two months down the line, yeah, my wife's laying dead, my kids are laying dead. I've hung myself up in the garage. Yeah. And it, it's things that could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. If they had people there from the start that can monitor the guys and uh, 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 um, look out for the warning signs. Yeah. That, I mean, it's, it's not a job anybody can do. No, no. It is not. Mm -mm. Somebody's actually asking a, quest a question here for you, Joe Kobe Boss. Vraag vir Rob, hoeveel dossiere kan een speerder perfect onderzoek, niks meer as 100? Nou daar, nou daar, nou draas speerder is tot 200 tot 300 dossiere. Hy kan dit nie hanteer, dis hoekom dossiere wegraak. So, dis actually a very valid point. So, now what we're doing is, we are actually playing with the stats. We didn't solve, because now also you are working towards your performance. You're, you're, Correct. You're like a appraisal. So now, from 300 dockets, 200 disappear. Because like like he mentioned, only 100, you know. So with the, with other words, you actually get 100, uh, 100% close rate, but 200 disappear. Yeah. No, um, theft of dockets is a big thing. Uh, it's not that the dockets are being stolen. It's the dockets are just being shoved away. Then I don't have to deal with it. I've got less work to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if... If you look at it on a daily basis, you come in, you've got your dockets that you're working on. Now you've got 300 dockets to work on. How is it possible in an eight hour period, Monday to Friday, that you can cover 300 dockets effectively and do your job properly? Mm -mm. It is impossible. Mm -mm. It's impossible. And you've got docket inspections where your dockets must go in. The officers want to see what have you been doing on your dockets. Now, oh, I haven't gotten to this docket because I haven't had the time for that docket. No. Now, they don't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. That's quite a lot. And that is, that is also why you, you see a lot of people are getting away with crimes these days. That's right. Because a detective will rather close a docket as it's undetectable mm -hmm. than actually have to do the job on the docket. It mm -hmm. makes his workload less. Yeah. yeah. But the crime's not being solved. Yeah. And that person gets away every time with crime, every time because there's a there's a detective that don't get to the bottom of the case because it's too much work for him. Correct. And also um the detectives are when they're charging suspects and not they're not doing what they should. You're supposed to take fingerprints, you're supposed to take photos, you're supposed to compile a database. Yeah. Which gets loaded onto the system. So you've got a guy that's coming through the system, every time he's coming through the system as a first first time offender, first time yeah. offender. Because the detective hasn't done his job properly. Yeah. Because he's never been shown how to do his job properly. That actually brings me, Rob, like the gentleman said here, Joe said, you can do 100 um, yeah. top. But in other words, if, if you have 300, that actually means you are doing three people's three jobs. Three people's work, yeah. That's how we're cutting. So for, for every for every 300 dockets, you give it to one cop. So in other words, that's why our, our country is in a mess like it is in currently. Because dockets disappear, people are getting, you know, nobody's being caught because the cop don't have time to still investigate, yeah. you know. And it's not pretty crimes. Some of these crimes are, are horrors, uh, you know, where guys, people were like killed and, and it just disappears. Yeah. The UN standard is one police officer to every 370 citizens, mm -hmm. about. The standard in South Africa is one cop to every 690 citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, it is next to impossible to police 690 citizens mm -mm. effectively on your own. You can't do it. It is, it's a hell of a workload. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's impossible. Yeah. It's, um, um, it's impossible. And for that reason, bringing that stats to now, putting it out, out there, it actually shows to you we are understaffed. We are heavy understaffed. Horribly understaffed. There's no way how we can expect things to come right if we don't employ the manpower the necessary and the proper manpower because we're sitting with understaffed people. And I don't understand I don't understand also um why government is allowing this. If crime is a problem, if crime is I mean 
Cape Town is, I think, the fourth uh, um, most dangerous city in the world. Yeah. What about South Africa? South Africa, you know, is also probably falling under a, I think, the top 30 city, um, top countries in the world. And for that reason, the only way forward is to fix our justice system, which is our, our, our law, and also get our um, SEPs back on track. I think our SEPs needs to be back on track ASAP. Yeah, SEPs needs to get back to the basics. Mm -mm. But not just that, they need to get SAPs, the, the, the prosecuting authority, and the magistrates, they need to get them on the same page. Yeah. Because the police is out there, they're busting their butts, taking the guys off the street. The prosecutors are busting their butts, trying to get the guys retained in, in, in custody, mm -mm. and the judges are letting him walk. Mm -mm. Tell me quickly, just be before we, we end, we've almost come to the, to the end of our show. In your honest opinion and and what do you think what is the way forward to fix apps because that is the question i'm i'll be honest with you i don't think Be Be becky Chaley knows what, what what to do so that's why i'm asking you as an experienced cop as somebody that's passionate about this what is this what is the right way forward because crime is out of control uh, we we you know if you drive down the road, there's a possibility that you will be got that somebody will kill you that somebody will hijack you they, it happens every day mm. The only reason we're going to fix this is obviously through our justice system. What do you think? What is the first steps, the critical steps that we that, that should be taken and put into play? First thing that SAPS needs to do to, to um, in my opinion, basically, it's get your mindset right. Mm -hmm. The guys must, they must accept the fact I'm here to do a job and I need to do my job. And I need to do my job to the best that I can do. That's... Mm -hmm. as, yeah, you're working for your family, you're working to provide for your family, but you're doing a job, you are uh, you are serving the community, you are serving the citizens of South, of South Africa, and that should take precedence. Mm. And if you are not prepared to do that, then rather resign and seek life elsewhere. That's right. Because you are contributing to the, the breakdown of SAPs, you are contributing to the increase in lawlessness in this country, mm and you are not prepared to take up the fight to stop it and to safeguard the citizens of this country because you've sworn an oath mm. that you will uphold the law, you will protect the constitution and the citizens of this country. And if you're not prepared to do that, then rather leave. Yeah. Get something else. Get something else, yeah. Grenville says here, a lot of detectives, and I think this um, actually links to what you said earlier on, a lot of detectives will understand this. All you can do with that workload is just to write note it and throw in the docket uh, for brought forward until the docket is closed. Yeah. So so that is the thing is that we are now, we don't have time for that. So we just work on what we can work. Yeah. And also, you have one van, you have one car in a station. And in some, not all stations, but in some stations. And for that reason, People don't have transport to get around. It, it is actually shocking to see that we have a lack of transport. Yeah, um, um, no, it was reported recently in the in the media that what was it? Eighty percent of SAPS's vehicles were standing. Yeah, they couldn't drive. So how do they expect the guys to get around to crimes? Bicycles, ride a skateboard, take mm -hmm. a bus, mm -hmm. what? Jump in a taxi? What must they do? So I mean, it's it's understandable. And that is the problem. And that is the problem where it comes, it, it all comes down to, I don't know, to good management. Yeah. Managing a station, managing the situation. Yeah, um, there it starts at the top. Mm -hmm. It starts at the very top. And I'm not even talking there about now you and the National Commissioner. It starts at Becky Taylor. Yeah. He wants the job, he wants the salary that comes with the job, which, mind you, um, that's a, a whole new topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, what to, what does he do to deserve that salary that he's earning? But anyway, that's another topic. Now, it starts the proper management mm -hmm. from the top down. You should have people in positions of power or senior positions that have been there, that have gone up through the ranks, that have worked on the road and know what the job entails. Yeah. Now you're bringing in somebody because they've got a college degree or a university degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, it's my... It's my second cousin or whatever. Got no idea what the job entails. That man is making decisions that impact. It's costing lives at the end of the day. They need people in, in, in the right position and they need the right people in those positions. And they need a ASAP. They need it like yesterday. <laughs> it should have been done last year already. 
Jake says your rope. The only way to get your to get uh, to get your cops back to the, sorry to scratch is to let your cops start doing foot patrols. It also motivates awareness. I don't know how you feel about that. Definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. But I think I think it's time. You know, you know what? The sad part is this because of just what we spoke about the lack of resources, the lack of cops. The citizens are now have to patrol. Yeah. The citizens have now to start. You know, Actually, we were yeah. enabled what's. Yeah. They have to start enabled what's. They need to start putting their lives in danger, because it comes down to a Pekicheli, to the minister of police not doing his job, not making sure the people underneath him is doing their job. And it sounds like it. It looks like they, you know, you have a lot of incompetent people in certain positions that they're not supposed to be. Yeah. Look, uh, uh, um, senior management in SAPS is. A it's power struggles. Mm-mm. It's every everybody's out for themselves. That's right. I'm in this position, and you'll do what I tell you. No, why well, must I do what you tell me? Mm. You, know, you come from nowhere. Who are you? And well, it, it's ridiculous, man. It's 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 killing saps. And you know, it it breaks my heart on a daily basis when I read these negative reports about saps. That's an organization that it's always been very dear to me. And yeah. I mean, you know, to go as far, as I have a love for saps. Yeah. Because that was my calling. That was what I wanted to do. Mm-mm. Growing up, I always wanted to be a policeman. I was always, no matter how old we were, no matter what we were playing, I was always, I was a policeman or I was the sheriff. Mm-mm. I was never the Indian or the outlaw. Or, yeah. No, yeah. that wasn't me. But it's, but it's true. We had a, we had the type of respect for Seps. Like I said earlier on, growing up, I wanted to be a cop. I mean, Theo, when we were young, um, what is that, that series? My my Amy Vice. My Amy Vice. We wanted yeah. to be crocket and tops, and and we wanted yeah. to be here in South Africa. No, I, I I used to watch all those police shows. I used to read all these novels about the police. Yes, even uh, um, factual stories about the police. Yeah, and as such, I got very much. I had a passion and a, oh, I had a very deep interest for homicide investigation, Mm-mm. not for murder, yeah. but for the investigation <laughs> into homicide. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, I've got a I've got a deep passion for that. Yeah. But it's, that, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's one of the most interesting crimes that you can work on is a homicide. <coughs> Trying to piece this puzzle together and it's something that's always interested me. Rob, that brings me back actually to you are a detective. You've been in the, doing this for many years. We just spoke about the stats now. Mm. I mean, you can, if they should employ you tomorrow, you can walk back into SEPs and help those detectives that are currently struggling. Also, maybe <coughs> looking at a position where they can take you guys, if you don't want to take you permanently, take you guys in. And, and, and maybe see, you know, on a, you know helping that, uh, the, the, the department to get back onto track. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Basically, look, the, the ex-members, we are plug-and-play members. Yes. We, don't, we don't have to go to college. We've been trained. We've got the experience. You can, they, they can call us tomorrow. Sign a contract tomorrow, and tomorrow we can be on the job doing our job. Yeah. And, and and just tell the, the the followers there is hundreds and thousands of views out there. Yeah, um, thousands. I would say it's up of about five thousand. Five thousand plus that, minus, yeah. That plus can minus. that can start tomorrow. It can start tomorrow. <coughs> plug and play members, and you know, um, the existing uh, current serving members of. They are very threatened by reenlistment because uh, mm-hmm. as far as they're concerned, we're coming back, we want to come back, we want to take their promotions. Yeah. It's not a case they'll be coming back to take their promotions. We're not taking their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. It's vacant, funded posts. Yeah. It's posts that are funded, mm-hmm. that are vacant, that they can't fill. Yeah. That is what they, they want the, the guys for. Yeah. To capacitate the stations and especially high crime areas and then to capacitate certain specialized units mm-hmm. that they need people for, POPs, yeah. Um, murder and robbery. Um, there was a gang unit. Gang unit, yeah. Mm-mm. There was a taxi um, violence thing. That one. And this unit they want to establish now to deal with the Zama <coughs> Zamas, these illegal yeah. miners. Yeah, yeah. That is what they're looking at the ex members for. But then in the All Western the Cape, units. the Western Cape, we want to take, th- uh, we're considering 37 applicants for this year. Yeah. That's in the Western Cape. Nationally, they're looking at 200 applicants. <laughs> You've had about. You've had almost 5,000 people apply, Mm-mm. but you want to take 200 people back. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. How does your logic work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need we need uh, 60,000 people to bring our numbers up to where it should be. Yeah. 
Yeah. But we were relying on new recruits for that. Who's going to train the new recruits? They're not taking members at, from stations, and the stations are already understaffed. Yeah. yeah. To go and work at the colleges as instructors. That is the sad reality uh, about the matter of of SEPs. I think we don't have enough time to talk. There's no. there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot. And just now we're gonna have um, load setting in the next couple of minutes. But gentlemen, thank you so much. Theo, is there anything you want to add from 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 your side before we end? No, I think Rob covered everything. Okay, okay, okay. Rob, you know, I'm um, just in closing. Um, we spoke about about law enforcement and metro police earlier, and the the is a project on at the moment with the city and they are considering ex SAPS members. And like I said, there's, uh, there's guys from around the country that are willing to relocate mm -hmm. to the Western Cape mm -hmm. to fall part of the project. Yeah. And if SAPS is not willing or, or able yeah. to make use of the members and the resources that we are offering them, yeah. I'm sure the city of Cape Town can. And I think that is the conversation we shouldn't have with the city of Cape Town. We yeah. should have because um, the, the Look, Leap is doing good. Yeah, and, and a lot Leap of people is doing exceptional work. And people won't agree with us because a lot of people are politicizing this. But we need to look at what those guys are doing. Leap is a project that the has... The baby is <laughs> dead. The baby is crying. Um, in actual fact, they've done such amazing work. They actually recovered a lot of stolen um, guns. You know, they're out there. So I think that is maybe the next conversation. We're going to have this conversation again. And I think we should maybe look at um, what we can do to help you guys get out there because we have a problem. We have, we a, have a big problem. problem. And the problem is that you guys are not out there patrolling and working for us. And in and, and, and a sense of government em employing you, putting you into the position that you're supposed to be. Yeah. So thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, and I hope to have you very back here very soon. Thanks and, for having us. And all the best. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Theo and Rob. They joined me from, you know, they were ex-cops, they were on SAPs, and, um, you know, looking at what is currently happening in SAPs, they need to get back into SAPs, and, 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 and you know, so there's a lot of them that needs to get back into SAPs to help our communities, to help um, SAPs get back on their feet, because many years later, SAPs has become a corrupt institution, just like your ESCOM, um, just like your other st uh, state-owned enterprises, and we need to look at how can we fix these type of things, and I want to reach out also. I know JP is watching. I know the mayor is watching. I know those guys are watching. Please reach out to us. Please reach out to, to these guys. We have the skill and we need these guys to be back in the position that you once were and restore law and order. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. From Stanley Jacobs, here's your uncle. Have a lovely evening. <laughs>